Have you guys ever just sat in a meeting before and just kind of zoned out? Did you enjoy that? Well, if you did, then I've got a movie for you. In the events of Shin Godzilla, first off, Godzilla was awesome. Second, this could have legitimately been like an hour shorter if we skipped all the literal meetings. What's that? You oh, think wait, I'm being no, dramatic? Wait. Well, of course I am. Welcome to the channel. As Shin Godzilla came lumbering up out of the water, it became clear rather quickly there was something horrifically wrong with this thing. Being a writhing mass of tumors that appeared to be in pain, the creature would walk horizontally to the ground and appeared to be doing very little apart from just running into things and dropping blood out of its gills. As we would come to find out this was only the second stage of its fully morphological transformation which later would begin to show this creature's tissue is capable of taking over the entire planet as it appeared to be something of a macro colony. But what is that exactly? Well let's discuss that in today's episode over Shin Godzilla and that one guy who's been asking since like 2021 is about to be really happy over this one. So we kick off our story hot off a copyright strike win that involves South Korea that hopefully Japan isn't going to obliterate this one for funsies. Time will tell on that. So we're out in Tokyo Bay. A boat named Glory Maru is floating without its owner. As they walk around it, nobody can be found as they attempt to figure out what happened. Calling it back in, the water underneath erupts, presumably sinking the boat and opening the hole in an underwater tunnel below, spilling blood into said tunnel. We do not know as it was never actually shown within the movie itself, but the creature below is what is known as the first form of Shin Godzilla. So a little bit of backstory to help you kind of make sense out of all this. In the 1950s, the US was attempting to be base chads, but instead were actually just being complete idiots dropping nuclear waste into the Bay of Tokyo. It appears that this creature within the bay was an ancient form of reptile from the Paleolithic era that had been surviving there for quite some time and was feeding on nuclear waste and needed about tree fitty. It appears that over this time frame, it would also cause this marine creature to grow to massive sizes, resulting in a creature whose genetic coding was rather unstable, which could induce adaptations on the fly to protect itself, as we will come to find out. Not only that, but through its genetic manipulation of its own body, it would form new limbs and alter bone structure in its body to become more adept to the environment it currently found itself in, which we will get to a little later as we move into its second form. This first form, however, is much more aquatic, possessing a longer tail and a more sickly color of skin due to its time residing on the sea floor. It would have fins on its back and gills running down its neck, which we will see here again momentarily. The eyes would appear much like to be like a fish's eyes due to the dark nature of the water that it resided in, and it was perfectly adapted to the bay and deeper waters it likely frequented. And in this time frame, its genetic structure was the most stable as it would imbibe radioactive material, which allowed for its metabolism to switch from an oxygen-based metabolism to likely a supplementation by that with radioactive materials. This would help account for the fact that its gills were still useful and necessary for its survival. However, the basis of its metabolism, where it gleaned energy, lies elsewhere. So we now meet our main man, Rando Yaguchi. He was discussing what happened, as they have no clue what's going on with the eruption, and I will try to fill you in as best I can, as there are a lot of meetings, and videos of meetings, and discussions of future meetings in this movie. I mean, my god, it was otherworldly. They discuss what it could have been that had caused the eruptions as an emergency response team is put together. The tunnel begins to be evacuated as they can hear something outside of it, and then they spot a giant chunk of the creature in the distance. The Prime Minister is then brought in to begin making decisions as the cabinet is also assimilated. They float the idea of it possibly being a volcano or hydrothermal vent, as one man mentions it's just a colossal creature. They ignore him, however, and then settle on it just being a hydrothermal vent, with no indication that that's what it is, but hey, why not? Yaguchi is then told to basically toe the line on this one rather than saying what it actually is because everybody will laugh at him, and in another meeting, he just kind of disagrees and tells them what it is. Then something hilarious happens. We get a title card that mentions how this entire meeting was abbreviated. Bro, this is the abbreviated version? I mean, you couldn't have abbreviated the other 30 meetings as well? Good lord. Anyways, at this point, the eruption activity begins to decrease, but Yaguchi reiterates how he thinks it's a giant animal. And as he does, a tail emerges, confirming it is indeed an animal. Well, this kind of changes kind of everything, so the squad discusses if they should blow it up, take it alive, or run it off. After extensive, and I mean extensive, conversation, where I got on my phone and started playing Clash of Clans for a minute, am I joking? Who knows? That's the fun. Like, this isn't even a sponsor segment. Anyways, they put Yaguchi in charge of building his own team as the creature finally makes its way towards the shore. They bring in some experts where one is a biologist and he mentions, oh, I would lose all credibility if I didn't have all the facts and made accusations of what it could be. My man, that's all we do. We look at life and make assumptions. Someone get old fence sitter out of here and put me in, coach. I'm ready to make the assumptions about how this thing is going to completely destroy my credibility. 
As the meeting wraps up, the creature has now made its way to a small river and is flooding the surrounding area. Yaguchi calls to an old friend from college and she examines the footage of the beast itself. In doing so, they determine that it does have legs, but it would be crushed under its own weight if it walked ashore. Which, let's talk about that. You have to ask yourself, why is it animals in the ocean can get so large, but on land, animals are pretty much topped out at the size of an elephant in current times? Well, there are several reasons. The first reason is, interestingly, which, uh, you know, never stop learning, is that really, if doesn't have to do really much with like oxygen say during like the dinosaur era compared to now making animals smaller right around actually the late triassic oxygen levels were below the 21 percent that we enjoy now yet there were still giant dinosaurs this level would increase during the mid cretaceous to around 27 percent and then around the kt boundary it would drop severely and then increase back to where it is now so oxygen doesn't inherently mean a larger animal although it did mean larger insects because their bodies are massively inefficient at oxygen distribution which is why circulatory systems uh, kind of basically came about due to the theory of evolution. So why were their bodies bigger? Well, it appears to be more related to heat exchange with the environment in a meat suit. Because uh, remember, honey, I shrunk the younglings? If you took a human with a human metabolism and you shrunk them, they would freeze almost instantly. And this is why something like a shrew being as small as it is, is just gonna have an incredibly fast metabolism. Something like an elephant has a slower metabolism and as such produces less heat, yet their bodies hang on to heat better. This process limits the size of animals, mostly into thermic animals, as only so much heat can be dissipated in relation to body size, which in turn limits their body size because their metabolism needs to still run to fuel their body. So these are rules that we live by, but there is a more glaring issue with the body size on land. You cannot just be giant because it's cool. Known as the square cube law, essentially it's an oversimplified way to explain how biomechanics cannot allow for something as large as Godzilla in any standard form. The bones can only handle so much compressional force and can only be so dense. Eventually a tipping point is reached and just by Godzilla standing, the bones would be pulverized into dust as both legs would break and then during the fall, his rib cage would shatter along with his spine as he would meet a quick end due to his own size. Because of this, under normal circumstances, it was safe to assume that Godzilla could not make it up on land. However, here's where the issues arise. While the ocean water supported his size, upon making contact to land, his bones actually would be breaking but it can be assumed based on his metabolic function, I would say we're not really dealing with kind of these typical restraints of a regular megafauna using calcium as the basis, and as a result, he's able to violate the square cube law as we know it. Moving on, the PM at this point decides to give a press conference as he states the creature cannot come on land, and as soon as those words like leave his mouth, well, there's my handsome man, he's on land. My god, look at this thing, it's like a chicken in hunting mode or something. As it stomps down the street, it continues to leak blood from his gills. This thing looks really gross, but good. Anyways, I can hear you asking why is it doing this? Well first let's talk about why my handsome boy is actually uglier than Sin. Remember he's aquatic and barely evolved at this point. Likely having quickly adapted uh, in the smaller waterway, his legs appear to be mostly the thing propelling him. Even in that short while, his legs have formed to allow him to stay mostly under the water as he retained what appears to be fish eyes. And that's what they really look like, it's kind of hilarious. Actually it's not hilarious, it's just nightmare fuel. Anyhow, emerging out of the water, we can see the structure of his body has slightly changed. So remember when you were like a youngling and you entered two feet of water, but you didn't want to get out into the wind? So you just sort of like pulled your legs up underneath you and glided across the bottom by walking? It's kind of a similar concept here. Of course, when he gets to land, he hasn't adapted yet, so as a result, he still has adopted this posture of the shallower water. However, once getting out, he also begins spilling blood all over the area from his gills. The reasoning is, is that the body is under massive pressure from a transformation happening. Oxygen being a part of his metabolism, but not the whole thing, is integral to understanding this. As his gills are exposed to air, they would rapidly incur damage, which in turn would cause blood vessels within the gills to burst, leaking tons of blood. But remember, he adapts under pressure of damage or something that is constantly applied. His legs that he has, again, look plantigrade, but also could be somewhat digitigrade. It, I don't know, it kind of looks plantigrade to me. However, he is in no way efficiently adapted to walking on land. But the fact that they are formed so quickly means the blood spilling out could have also been the creation of say proto lungs building and sloughing away material and then rapidly beginning to take in air from another method besides just water and this is why in stage two i think shin godzilla almost appears to be panicked as air would be difficult to come by and it was likely incredibly painful at the same time causing him to just run and try to escape the pain even if he was currently adapting to the environment in fact there is a, a kind of a 
headcanon thing, maybe it's headcanon, not for me, but just what's been said, that no matter the form Shin Godzilla's in, he's just in an incredible amount of pain. So by this point, the skin on his body begins to darken somewhat and the mouth continues to change. It should also be noted that the budding limbs on his upper torso are not under the same selective pressure that his legs are under, so there is less need for them to grow as quickly, and as we will come to find out, they will remain mostly useless and vestigial for the duration of this attack. As the creature moves through, hilariously there's footage of it destroying the same building twice in this movie, and they thought I wouldn't notice, but more meetings are mobilized in an effort to put meetings together to solve the problem as this thing continues just kind of sliding its way through the city. I absolutely hate this thing. They discuss further what they should do as they need to bring in their defense forces. Something to remember though is, like with Japan, after World War II, the treaty that they have with the U.S. has pretty much stripped them of an active military. Yaguchi says that they need a two-pronged approach to deal with this thing, military force and civilian evacuation. In another meeting, the military talks about what they should do, but they aren't positive if they should use concussive force detonators near an area with so many civilians as it could take them out. So they mobilize the helicopter pilots to go and take some pot shots at this thing to try to stop it. As Shin Godzilla walks through, he suddenly stops after years of being a gamer, he walks into the sunlight for the first time and actually stands upright. Its feet go from, again, what appeared to have been plantigrade structuring that caused it to walk horizontal, to ones more likened to the standard Godzilla form being digitigrade, meaning that he's now more efficient at his ability to travel on land. His skin then shimmers as cells undergo rapid mitosis, leading it to mutate within seconds, growing in size and forming appendages from the buds that it had earlier, now possessing what appears to be mostly, again, vestigial arms that are fused to his sides. The skin is cracked and red with folds of darkened tissue. Its mouth forms kind of more fully as it lumbers forward unsteadily, waving its tail around as it marches towards an unknown target. But before moving on, let's talk about the skin because this adaptation is rather interesting. Clearly, once again, the selective pressure of going from deep waters to where the sun doesn't really shine to the surface of a planet and into the sunlight could be likened to basically landing on a new planet entirely. A lot of deep sea creatures will never come into contact with sunlight in their lifespan, and as a result, it is highly unlikely that they will have the ability to deal with ultraviolet radiation as successfully as land-dwelling animals can. Shin Godzilla would have to deal with the same issues. As solar radiation passed into his body, this would put the beige skin that he was sporting that likely isn't protecting his body as readily under immense pressure to change and adapt. Much like in our species, our skin colors vary based on intensity of the sun. Near the equator, skin is darker, whereas if you move north or south from there, it will become lighter based on distance. The reason is melanin with exposure to the sun will move in front of the actual nucleus in order to protect the genetic material. This will cause a darkening of the skin. Sort of like when you get a tan. If your family has lived in an area long enough, your body will adapt to the amount of sunlight with melanin remaining a permanent fixture for some to protect them, whereas other people will get darker as only an adaptation temporarily. And in still some others, it seems like they could just burn in the moonlight as they possess very little melanin. And this could account for the change that we see in Godzilla. As his cells were exposed, adding to the panic movement of the second phase, his cells would develop more melanin rapidly as the skin itself grew at cancerous rates, giving it a non-uniform appearance, with some areas actually having a deep red pigmentation, which is likely the color of the blood as it's closer to the surface. As it will be made mention, the blood acts as a cooling mechanism for this creature. Should the thick skin cover the body in entirely, the blood could not use the air around to cool itself, which in turn would cause a whole host of issues. Areas critical to keeping cool, such as the spinal column and near the base of the brain, appear to be the most open areas, but also along the abdomen and upper torso, pockets of deep red can be seen. Leftover traits such as the dorsal fins can be seen and also likely help facilitate cooling down the body, much like how we find evidence of dinosaurs possessing these same adaptations. Moving forward into the city, the helicopters arrive, realizing it's way larger than it was earlier. The PM tells them to fire, but civilians are spotted nearby as they call it off entirely as the area is still populated. The PM aborts the attack, having listened to Yaguchi about focusing on saving lives, not attacking the creature. The helicopters then fly off as we get a close-up of the face of something only a mother could love. Good lord, this thing is ugly. But as they do, the creature then breaks through some buildings and heads back to the water in order to cool its nuclear fission reactor in its chest basically. The next day everything is shut down, all flights stop, other governments are offering support and help, and people are out on their morning jog for some reason, like what are you doing? Like look, if there was ever a reason to day drink, this is it. Now I'm not advocating drinking, uh, you shouldn't do it, but I'm gonna have a beer at noon if a giant lizard destroys half my town. Looking over at the devastation, they are concerned that this thing could come back as they dispatch ships to try and find it. Meanwhile, 
In another thrilling meeting, they discuss where it went and what they should do with it as they head over to the military meeting to talk about blowing it up as now the head of the tertiary meeting where they discuss nothing as Yaguchi then sets up a phone meeting to put together his own team as Misfits meeting begins. Seriously, five meetings just jumping around. Like, I'm not even joking. Look at this. This movie was two hours long. It's not crazy, but I, I really think it could have been like a short story otherwise. Anyhow, apparently the Americans at this point are really pushing for burning the remains, which is a little sus because they made an oopsie doopsies back in the 50s and dumped a bunch of radioactive material into the bay, which is typically the last thing that you wanted to do. Nice job, guys. They're also more concerned about what its energy source actually is. At that size, it is suggested that a standard oxygen metabolism wouldn't be efficient enough, as Hiromi suggests maybe it is nuclear fission. Everyone laughs, and I have to ask why that would even be a thought, but the plot demands it. But really, she's not actually wrong. At that size, the amount of oxygen and food this creature would need to take one step would be staggering. There would not simply be enough lung space to saturate the blood enough in a meaningful way that would be able to properly perfuse the muscles. As a result, by existing, this creature wouldn't survive. Ergo, it must have a metabolism and energy acquisition method that is beyond our metabolism. Essentially, here's how it goes. We breathe in oxygen and take in nutrition. Once this happens, it enters the glycolysis cycle, which then results in a pyruvate oxidation, which is why we breathe oxygen and how that comes into play. We breathe out carbon attached to oxygen as a waste product, but the whole purpose is to obtain ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And this is the source of energy for our bodies. And when one of those phosphates are broken off, it becomes adenosine diphosphate. In that break is where we get our energy. Energy itself is the point that powers the cell. So having this metabolism is great, but if you can find a better energy source, well, now you're cooking with gasoline. For reference, one gram mole of ATP releases about 470 kilojoules of energy, which is pretty sweet, right? Well, as we find out with Godzilla is a basically a nuclear reactor, Essentially, if we take what we know, depending on the type of isotope of, say, uranium, for instance, uranium-235 to be exact, it has around 76 billion kilojoules per gram mole. So you can start to see having that over a standard oxygen-based metabolism would provide the energy necessary for Godzilla to function beyond what a standard land animal can. And also, just for fun, because we're already talking about it, so... As we all know, like you need calories, roughly about 2,000 calories per day in order to maintain bodily function for the standard adult male. What's interesting is one gram of uranium-235 has 20 million calories in it. And if you take uh, an average lifespan of a human in say about 80 years, 2,000 calories per day, that means you would need roughly about 58,400,000 calories in an entire lifetime. So if you started off with three grams of uranium-235 at the beginning of your life, you would never need to eat again and would still have 2.6 million calories to spare if you died at 80 years old. So anyways, as Yaguchi talks with the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, they mention how radiation levels are rising, but there are no leaks in their plant. As Yaguchi wonders where it's coming from, a guy from behind him starts spinning around and yelling, giving him info in the most inefficient and annoying way possible as Hiromi comes over and actually shows Yaguchi the same info. The radiation matches the path that the creature took, meaning it's leaking radiation everywhere, suggesting Hiromi is, in fact, correct that Godzilla is using a form of internal fission reactor to move. Okay, from here, just assume whenever I talk about something that isn't as explicitly related to military action or Shin Godzilla, that it's in a meeting. So now a woman who suspiciously looks like my Tinder date for the entire weekend from 2014 prior to dating my wife shows up. That's right. Once upon a time, I knew what the ladies like. Anyhow, she now arrives, her name was Kayoko, and she was dispatched from the US to aid in Japan's fight against this thing, and she meet- got meetings with the top people to form a strategy for dealing with this creature. The US is also massively invested in the idea of this thing, because of course we are, but she is sent to work with Yaguchi because apparently she's considered a political person, and so was he. I mean, really, he just seems like a natural born leader more so than a politician. So now information surfaces about a professor who went missing that May know something about Gojira. And uh, there's an entire meeting to discuss his name in the movie. It is a four minute interaction. They also find Gojira as the Japanese call it or Godzilla as the Americans call it, was likely snacking on the delicious nuclear material that was in Tokyo Bay that shouldn't have been there at all. Again, mistakes were made. 
They now know that it was an ancient form of life that was then mutated by the nuclear waste. They unroll a map of what Godzilla left behind, but they can't make sense of it. So blah, 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 reconstruction bill, blah, 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 meetings, and then not blah, blah, blah. They discover based on the radiation reports that Godzilla had a new element contained within his body that has never been seen before. But they cannot make heads or tails of the actual physiology as an idea is then floated. Godzilla has that nuclear reactor in his body and his blood must be the cooling mechanism, which is why it regressed to a sea creature originally to cool its body temperature after mutating as it had not yet perfected the ability to cool itself. If they could shut down the cooling system, they could also freeze it. So they call it the Yaguchi plan and that is launched. So now there's some protest about save Godzilla. Not really sure why, all it's really done is look creepy and crawl through the street and destroy things. And everyone is tired AF because they've been going for a few days straight at this point. The creature has now returned to totally ruin everyone's life and is much larger now. And better yet, he has officially grown to the point that he has adapted to land travel as his cooling system using his blood has been perfected. As it lumbers up, this thing is absolutely massive. People begin noping out of there as we head towards another meeting, of course. The creature has entered its fourth form. Apart from the size increase being double what it was when it retreated back into the water, it has stretched out somewhat. Because the muscle mass and fat mass did not appear to increase in proportion to this growth, it is more skeletal with many more jagged features. Its feet are now just completely digitigrade in structuring, which we saw earlier, but they also appear to be longer. Muscle appears to be somewhat exposed in openings in the skin, likely due to the rapid growth of the body, more so the skeletal system. The rib cage appears to protrude from the skin, somewhat having burst through, and we can see something interesting within the mandible itself. Much like with gigantism in humans, sometimes if the mandible grows to a large size, this can actually cause fractures to form as the arch is broken. As we will see with his fourth form later, the mandible has cracked, indicating that skeletal growth is rampant and near cancerous. Rows of shark-like teeth line the mouth, likely a leftover adaptation from its aquatic era, and the eyes are beady at this point, having lost their fish-like appearance, and now have developed a nictitating membrane to protect the eyes from its own capabilities. Interestingly, when it does attack, they will close much like a great white shark's will as they take a bite of something. And given that this thing is so big, it's sort of hilarious when for some reason an evacuation loudspeaker suggests everyone go back inside and stay inside. Like a building isn't gonna help against this thing, obviously, and it just appears to move in a straight line. So if you see it coming, just walk three blocks over. But it continues walking along as they try to figure out where it's even going. So far, they have no clue as to what its actual end goal is, and they decide that they need to hit it with everything they have, otherwise it's going to destroy Tokyo. Because it's spilling radioactive material everywhere, they decide to go for the head and legs to decrease the release of these materials. The PM authorizes the use of force as all explosives are uh, literally used against this thing, but nothing seems to be working. As lead bounces off of its face, they then switch to missiles, opening up on it, and it also predictably does nothing, as then the tanks and artillery join in as the barrage continues, but to no avail. So here's why this is hilarious. I mentioned this in my video over the Death Angels and A Quiet Place, but just because you can stop around doesn't mean you're walking away unscathed. There are these little things called energy transfers. When a round is stopped by something hard, the energy on the other side will continue and balloon that tissue, rupturing it and causing extensive bleeding. In fact, there are rounds designed to hit tanks that won't go through the armor, but will blow the back plate metal out and produce shrapnel in the tank itself to take people out. When hitting Godzilla with bunker busters, I don't care how thick its skin is or how strong that armor plating appears to be, the energy transfer would liquefy any cell on the other side. Now there is an idea that will come up later that these are extremophiles, which is a little strange, I will say, but not completely impossible, but just sheer force, a universal constant. I don't care what this thing is. Bonds would be broken, cells would be ruptured, and it would be heavily damaged. So we can assume that the brain is in control of this creature, right? Well, if that's the case, then liquefying the brain would absolutely stop it from moving. I just wanted to throw that out there, and also we'll get to the extremophile conversation here in a moment. The tanks then begin noping out of there because Godzilla says, LOL, that tickles, and then walks across the river, heading towards Tokyo, completely exhausting their capabilities as the US officials nope out of there too to go talk to their air force. So uh, things are about to go from bad to worse. The US deploys stealth bombers to destroy the thing as it moves towards Tokyo. The skin of Godzilla begins to glow red as the US goes to deploy its non-nuclear arsenal on this creature as damage to the area is going to be immense. The PM gets evacuated along with the rest of the cabinet and he's going by helicopter as Yaguchi is going by car. As they look out and see Godzilla, the US then drops this bomb. It broke through the skin as Godzilla begins bleeding. As he does though, he begins to turn purple, signaling that he's a fire in his laser, and then releases a fire blast into the ground, which uh, as we know, obviously is a callback to nuclear bombs. 
The beam then becomes more focused as it blows the bombers out of the sky, and there's also just random beams on his back. This is an adaptation due to the response by the damage incurred by the body via that explosion. The idea is no matter how hard you hit it, it just adapts a way to defend itself, making it pretty much invulnerable. This also blows up the surrounding buildings, and strangely enough, Godzilla gets like a hat trick and destroys the PM's helicopter. I mean, had they taken off like five seconds before or after, they would have been totally fine, but with this energy release, Godzilla then falls asleep standing up in the midst of the destruction. This may seem odd, but at this point, it is likely due to the fact that this is just a bit of a change from his standard operational status. Typically, as we know, he uses oxygen and hydrogen to help power the nuclear fission within his body. Without it, it takes time for the energy to build back up, which takes longer as it uses just the oxygen in the air as opposed to the abundant oxygen and hydrogen in water, considering H2O has a lot of hydrogen and oxygen. This drops his metabolism exceedingly low, which in turn puts him in a comatose state as the energy slowly builds back up in his body after this massive utilization. Yaguchi throws a bit of a tantrum because of this and then goes to meet at another meeting. With Tokyo being contaminated, they lack the materials and manpower low, uh, morale's not doing so hot. Things are definitely not turning up Millhouse at this point. The leader of agriculture was put in charge as he's really not up for the job, but they need someone to fill the power vacuum. Gucci gives everyone a pep talk at this point about doing it for the fallen and being alpha chads. You know, the usual. I literally cannot stress how meetings move this movie forward. They take the tissue samples from Godzilla and keep an eye on him, as well as make sure he isn't waking up as they determine they have about two weeks at the current rate. How they know this? Well, there's really no established patterns with this thing, so that's beyond me. They send in drones to watch Godzilla as they are immediately destroyed as they get close by what I can only assume is radiation in the area around Godzilla. This means anything electrical is a no-go, but a human in a suit might be able to withstand this radiation. One team is set in as they retrieve a sample and find the tissue is unstable and can mutate into anything. This alarms the US considering it is now understood this tissue could colonize the rest of the planet and push man out of the top of the food chain. Because of this, the U.S. wants to Team America Godzilla using their nuclear arsenal. Satomi at this point says they have no other choice but to drop that on Godzilla, which obviously the citizens and military are not too thrilled about. Yaguchi discusses how that is a bad idea as they discuss putting their fate in the U.N.'s hands. And yeah, I gotta say, I wouldn't want to do that either. But thankfully, being in the U.S., the U.N.'s laws are really just more suggestions than anything. USA, baby! So they set their plan, and then with a nuke incoming, they will get this coagulation mechanism set up and ready to go and just not evacuate. The chemical plants are set up and running and they will need to do a lot to make this work. In 360 hours, Gojira's energy beam will reactivate and devastation will continue. Again, how do they know this? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. They also have roughly about two weeks to evacuate everyone in Tokyo, and with a nuke coming in anyways, it's probably the best option anyhow. Japan at this point isn't doing so hot as many refugees are just everywhere because Tokyo's a really big place, and it shutting down has also caused many other issues. Godzilla will be disastrous for the economy. How many tax dollars do I have to throw at it to feel safe again? <laughs> uh, topical humor about completely stupid events. I love it. So we also see Godzilla's scale crack, meaning that he is warming back up. As they continue to try to decipher Maki's info, they realize maybe they just need to fold the printout, not read it two-dimensionally. It's origami that when folded, it shows molecular interactions that are being formed in the body. Essentially, wherever there is water, Godzilla can power the nuclear reactor in his body utilizing oxygen and hydrogen, making him potentially indestructible. Utilizing a supercomputer, though, they solve the riddle and are now able to to basically see that his cells are extremophiles. And what's that I hear you asking? Well, let's discuss. Extremophiles are a form of life that can exist in, well, as you know, extreme areas, such as at the bottom of the ocean near hydrothermal vents, or say like the water bears or tardigrades as they're known, that are found to survive in space for some time. These cells are incredibly stable, which is funny given how Shin Godzilla's instability is causing him to mutate, but they are hard to kill as well and can exist in temperatures and pressure ranges outside what normal cells would essentially succumb to. And I bet you're a lot like me. You're curious as to why this is the case. Well, the reason that they are able to specifically do this is they possess something called an extremozyme, which essentially keeps their metabolism of a cell operating at higher temperatures, whereas our enzymes would completely denature resulting in the death of that cell. Now, typically these are single-celled organisms, but what is being suggested here is that this is a multicellular organism composed of extremophiles. Because of this initial new form of multicellular organism, this is why I believe it is able to use radioactive waste for nutrients. For normal cells, this would destroy them, but for an extremophile, it may be able to survive long enough for new adaptations to be impressed upon their DNA, allowing them to adapt quicker. This is essentially why one Shin Godzilla could dethrone man, because this form of life is much tougher than any life found up here in layman's terms. So Izumi at this point goes to talk to Satomi about deploying the Yaguchi plan, which Satomi says is too late. But I mean, I mean, why not try it before turning the nukes, I suppose? I mean, it seems like a good idea to me. 
But with very little resistance, Satomi's like, oh yeah, that does make sense. So with two days left, it's gonna take three days to make all the coagulants. So France talks to the US, which somehow convinced Americans not to blow something up. This is not the country I grew up in. Freedom isn't free. Now there's a heft, I'm legally required not to finish that statement. Kyoko then talks to her old man and decides not to leave and stays in Japan to help Yaguchi. So the chemicals are set up, the trucks are loaded, and it's now time to head into the radiation zone. Yaguchi gives a speech, which is basically a glorified meeting, as everyone heads out to deal with this creature. So at this point they send in the trains. Wakey wakey, it's time for school! And as they blow, the drones are sent in to deplete Godzilla of his beams and spare human life. As they send in the sixth wave, the radiation is increasing and the city is getting shrekt. His tail then begins firing its laser, which I've already used that joke, but it is what it is. And eventually it flames out as he loses the radiation that he had before. They then blow up some buildings to drop them on him and trap him. So the first platoon now moves in with trucks. As they start to piperpuree this thing with the chemical, and I'm also legally required to tell my editor to not look up that person and do not include a picture unless it's uh, SFW, as they uh, continue to basically put this coagulant in his body, well, the Platoon 1 totally gets screwed as Shin Godzilla wakes back up and fires his laser at them. Uh, and then they send in more trains, blowing him up and knocking him down once more. Then more coagulant is administered, but this time reaching the needed theoretical dose to freeze him. After that is done, Godzilla gets back up and takes a few more steps before he flash freezes. His chest drops to negative 196 degrees as he's frozen solid. Which, uh, I mean, I thought this was a coagulant, so why did that happen exactly? Well, that's a great question, bro. I know you had the question. I'm totally good, because I totally know what's going on. So, uh, you can think of it this way. The body being a collection of extremophiles, and with what we will see here in a moment, all want to survive in this macro colony if that idea is to hold any water. So, we know the blood is the cooling mechanism, and this is sent to the cells in the back and the skin to keep the nuclear fission at the core of the body under control and stable. Once the blood coagulates, you can think of the extremophiles as like a nuclear reactor. What is the first thing people are going to do in that situation? That's right, stop the reaction by dropping the temperature really, really low. Under normal circumstances, if this wasn't the case, the blood would cause the nuclear reactor to enter a meltdown phase, which would not be good. The body protects itself instead by opting to stop the nuclear reaction entirely and essentially freezing itself to prevent this meltdown. Now, realistically speaking, would this be possible? No, not really. Cells would not be capable of shedding that much heat all at once to flash freeze in order to stop the reaction. But I imagine they were kind of going for this since it could like generate that much heat. There must be a mechanism to absorb that much heat and place it to transfer into the blood of Godzilla. Thus, if it were to transfer too much heat, it would instead freeze the body. Like I said, I believe that's what they were going for. So as they check the survey data, they find the new isotope actually only has a half-life of 20 days. What's a half-life? Well, essentially it's a time for a nuclear isotope to decay into something more harmless. This means in two to three years, Tokyo will be back to its baseline levels of nuclear radiation, whatever that may be. And Yaguchi is suggested that maybe he should run for election as everyone is pretty jazzed about him taking out Godzilla. They then discuss how nukes will be used if Godzilla ever wakes back up again. And I mean, just start dismembering that thing like immediately because while it worked, you never know. Grab a tool, anything, cut that thing apart. The immortalized words of that one Alpha Chad in Dead Space who uh, left a voice log about literally uh, just cutting apart necromorphs. Based. So as we move over to Shin, we also see something rather odd. Humanoid forms are a part of his tail, attempting to branch off before they became frozen. They failed, meaning they got stuck in form 4.8, but the things frozen in the tail itself are the fifth form of this creature, which takes on a much more hominid appearance, which would indicate, interestingly, Shin, as stated, is a macro colony. Shin Godzilla is a wretched abomination of a creature that in this particular movie only makes it to his fourth form. As it advances up in forms, I believe the sixth form is way cooler, where he just sits there and vomits radioactive Blood. That would have been dope to see, but if you guys know where to find these other forms and where they come into play, let me know. I would love to do a part two of this video if you guys actually enjoyed this. But until then, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a like as it really does help the video get in the algorithm. And subscribing gets you notified as well as tagging that bell of when I post in the future. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel link where last week we talked about the Ohio chemical spill accident. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, I'd like to thank our astronaut, Rosie Kinks. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Des Dancer, as well as our scientist, Arjun Sentinel, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanation, of B grade horror movies, Logan Satome, Lucian Dragon, Robbie Cruz, and Tyson Nakanishi. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running on this channel and is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I will see y'all in the next one.